Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is William Flint. I wear two hats uh, during the course of my career. Um, my, my evening job is I'm head coach at uh, Croydon Gymnastics Club. We're an artistic club, so um, I, I do understand the, the, the coaching constraints. Uh, my day job is I'm senior consultant at a health and safety company. Um, my experience spans Legionella, uh, asbestos, um, the nuclear industry. Um, I'm also working for various leisure facilities, uh, including one uh, very high profile, uh, wives and girlfriends footballers uh, fitness club. Um, so the, the, the experience I have as a, as a background is fairly broad. And uh, obviously with COVID, I've been working right the way through it. Um, predominantly producing risk assessments for construction companies working with vulnerable adults or vulnerable people to protect both the operatives and the, uh, and the people within the, uh, the properties that they're working. So the whole COVID-19 situation is uh, fairly well understood now. Uh, it is going to continue to evolve, as they always do, but we are where we are, unfortunately. Now, I'd like to start by shattering a few hopes and dreams. Um, COVID-19 is here to stay. We're not going to get back to any, any normal in three months' time. We're not going to go back to the way coaching was. That situation is now long, long gone. If you anticipate and COVID-19 will be with us for approximately two years, and you may well be work, uh, working with some form of uh, mitigation or control measure for at least, uh, at least the next 12 months, potentially longer. I think the return to normal, I, I think by the time we're allowed to return to normal, we'll go, what's normal? I think the change will be that, will be that seismic. Now, what I'd like to do first off is discuss the, the means of transmission, because everyone assumes they know how the virus is transmitted. There's three ways the virus can fundamentally be transmitted. The first one is clearly in direct droplet form, where someone sneezed or coughs on you and you, and you inhale it. The virus is uh, a respiratory um, infection, so you have to inhale it. You can't actually absorb it through your skin, but you can breathe it in. The next means of, uh, of transmission is from contact surfaces. So if someone has contaminated a surface, you then touch the surface and bring that contamination into your respiratory area, i.e. your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth. So flicking your fingers is probably not the best thing to do. And the one area that everyone forgets about is bodily fluids. Okay, people do bleed. Young children do have accidents in the gym. And all of those uh, bodily fluids have the potential to transmit the virus. That includes sweat actually to a, to a greater or lesser extent. The, uh, the research, it hasn't really been done. It is a new virus. Where that virus has come from, well, it depends which conspiracy website you read, but uh, maybe it's man-made. Maybe it's naturally occurring. Either way, it's new to us as a species. So we're not quite sure how it's going to work. The other point I would make is that the virus has already mutated. We're now on to uh, mutation SG196, sorry, 916, um, which is 10 times more contagious than the original virus. It still actually doesn't cause any more harm than the original virus, but actually it is 10 times more contagious which is potentially why Italy, Spain, and, and ourselves have been hit harder possibly than China was in the first instance. So there is some science behind the, uh, the figures. Um, that said, it is possible to work around it. It needs to be possible to work around it. The next thing I need to say is that no matter what we do, no matter how careful we are in the gym, we cannot entirely remove the risk some risk will remain. We can control the risk as far as reasonably practicable, no more. The other point I will make is that actually a waiver, uh, having your gymnast or your parents sign a waiver saying you will not be held responsible for contracting COVID-19 is an absolute waste of time. Okay, it cannot stand up in court. You cannot... Um, push the liability 
onto a parent or on, onto, a, onto a, a, um, a participant in that manner, purely because it's a known hazard, it's a known risk. We know about COVID-19 now, we know it exists, we know we need to manage it. How do you think we need to manage it is the next question. Where do we go from here? Actually, I'd like to have a quick show of hands. You've you, you, you all got a show of hands button, haven't you? Everyone know how to do that? Just give me a nod or a thumbs up. It's in your participant pane. Um, okay. I raise hand at the bottom of it. Excellent, right. Okay, the question I'd like to ask you is how many of you do not intend supporting gymnasts when you return to the gym? Can you clarify, do you mean physically support with your hands or do you yeah. mean psychologically? Yeah, let's, let's ignore emotional support for a moment. Um, but actually physically supporting. So who, who's going to teach a tuck back without supporting it? I would suggest no one. Because actually, there's, there, there's, there's two aspects to every risk assessment we need to do. One is COVID-19, certainly. But COVID-19 is just dominating the, 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 the conversation at the moment. What about the rest of safety hazards that we always have had and always will have? The two need to sit hand in glove. We can't just have a COVID risk assessment, which theoretically works, because in practice it will fail. What we need to consider is 360 degree safety. Actually, dealing with COVID with the level of severity it requires, whilst coaching safely, whilst deal with dealing with child welfare correctly. You know, all the other good stuff that we've always done as a coach. So that, that's, that's the challenge, because I, for one, know that I will be supporting my gymnasts physically in the gym when we return. I also know there are no BG guidelines to that effect. So therefore, that means that I will be coaching outside the guidelines given by BG. But actually, I can't not support a gymnast to coach safely. It's a chicken and egg, isn't it? Hands up if you agree with me. We're going to have to support, simple as that. Okay, so how do we go about understanding and putting things into practice? The first stage is obviously a risk assessment. Okay, and the risk assessment has to be specific to your environment, specific to each building, each area that you operate within. So if you operate across 20 sites, you are going to have 20 separate risk assessments because they have to be specific to what you're doing. Okay, that risk assessment has to be written by somebody or a team of people who are competent to do so. So they need to understand on one hand risk assessment, on the other hand, what you intend to do. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a hard one. That risk assessment is going to consider COVID-19 and your other coaching problems. So it'll become a holistic risk assessment. And that will consider everything from death to trivial injury. Absolutely certain to, if penguins are wearing underpants and, uh, and Pluto is eclipsed by, by Saturn, unlikely. That is the type of risk assessment that you need to firstly have in place. And from that risk assessment, we can drive out something called a safe system of work. That is how we're gonna coach, how we're gonna operate our gym how people come in, how they move through the space, what numbers they're gonna come in at, how frequently they come in, where we put hand washing in. You know, if you read the BG guidance at the moment, you're supposed to have, you know, four activity stations and a hand washing station, which is gonna be great, isn't it? Okay, let's do handstands, cartwheels, let's do, I don't know, round off preps, and let's finish off with 15 minutes of hand washing. That I'm sure is gonna be awesome. The kids are gonna love that, okay? I don't think that's the approach that I'm gonna take. Hand washing is going to play an important role, but that can work within the rotations anyway. Now, when considering your risk assessment, considering how you, put, well, firstly, who are you gonna protect and how are you gonna protect them? I would suggest probably, actually, let's wind back a little bit, okay, before we get into that. It is certain that someone who comes to your gym is going to have COVID-19. That is certain. 
it is, uh, over the course of the next year, two years, it is certain someone will come to your gym with COVID-19. Absolutely no question. How do we stop them is the first question. Where is the first line of defense that you have? Because the first line of defense that you have is that gymnast front door. I'll suggest possibly the first seismic change that we make to, the, uh, to, to our, our clubs is that actually a gymnast is reporting to the club their health before they even leave home. So if you're training on Monday at five o'clock, we require an email from you. We're actually setting up a little um, SharePoint um, system to, to, to manage this. So that gymnast or their parents and guardian will report, I do not have any flu-like symptoms. I have not been exposed to anyone suffering from COVID-19 to my knowledge. I'm fit and healthy before they even leave home. Okay, if I have any of those things, I'm really sorry, but you're not training today. When they get to the gym, we have another opportunity to, to, to prevent that, that disease coming into the gym. We we'll ask the question again, because how many people just go for a tick box exercise? Yeah, 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 it's fine. I'm, I'm fine trained. I've, I've got a competition coming up. I've got to be in the gym. Well, actually, if you have someone come in with COVID-19 into your gym, it will probably close your gym. Local lockdown will, 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 will come to pass. So actually, you may have a competition in six weeks' time. You may want to train. The club has to come first. We're actually going to take temperatures as well. That's what we're going to do. We have um, an intra, um, uh, infrared thermometer. Anybody who comes in at an incorrect temperature, I'm afraid is, is going to be going home. That's third ball, 37.4 is normal, 37.6 is raised, 37.8 is your fine infection. Okay, so 37.6, we're going to start asking questions. We'll ask someone to sit, sit still for a bit and retake the temperature. 37.8, uh, they're going home. Because that is the point we can exclude that from the gym. That, that's the first thing to do, exclude the disease from the gym. Now, the thing that comes out of that, having accepted that the virus is going to get in the gym sooner or later, how do we build in robustness to the club? So if we do get a case reported, the club doesn't have to close. Because at the moment, if you have an uncontrolled situation, sorry, another question's coming in. Yeah, temp, che temp checks on the door, definitely, um, is, 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 my, is my guidance. Um, what was I up to? Yeah, robustness. So at the moment, if we just have a gaggle of kids arriving, and we don't have any necessary control over them, we potentially have well, a class of 24, 32, um, all having to self-isolate or at least be tested. If we break that down to smaller amounts and we actually sort of group that pod together, same as they're doing in schools, okay? My intention is to bring kids in in groups of eight. So one coach, eight kids, coaching levels are maintained, at which point, they enter the one-way system. So the first, the first station would be, for argument's sake, talking about rec gymnastics now, by the way, not squad. Squad's going to a slightly different ball game. We'll talk about that in a minute. But so they come in a 15-minute warm-up. They move off of that station into the next area. Another eight children come in, another coach, at which point they go to warm-up. And we would have vacuumed the area in between. So at which point you then stagger your gymnast through your gym. You bring eight in at a time, potentially. I'm putting this forward as, as a suggestion. And by grouping them together in that eight pod, if I get one reporting, eight gymnasts are at the gym. That's the worst case. And all the time we're actually undertaking this activity, we're maintaining social distancing. So the kids are separate from each other. Okay. Now there are some things that are going to have to be common equipment for argument's sake. Now there are some things we can do to limit the risk of the equipment. But you know how fast kids want to go through, they, how, how fast they want to work. 
if for, for example, we're working volts, most gyms have one volt, don't they? Not eight. Is it reasonable to try and clean that vault down every time someone goes over it? Particularly, well, they'll go maybe what, 15 seconds later, they'll go again. Another 20 seconds, they'll go again, maybe, unless they're 14 years old, in which case they're probably staying around talking for 15 minutes, in which case you've got loads of time to clean stuff down. But it's, it's all about minimizing the risk, not removing it. Now, one of the things that we're doing, we were putting, we're going to be putting vault, uh, vault covers over and beam covers over, uh, available from PG Foam, by the way. Uh, they're vinyl covers, so they can be, be wiped down fairly quickly. But cleaning needs to be considered in and around the, um, the other safety aspects. If I've just wiped down a vault top or a beam top with antibacterial spray, it's now slippery. Therefore, it can't be used until it's dried. Am I expecting to be able to wipe it down every time a gymnast goes on that piece of equipment? No. I'm doing as much as I can to minimize the risk. How much virus is going to be spread from someone's feet or from their hands? Probably not very much, unless they're doing this when they're coughing into their hands. And we've already isolated anyone who's coughing or sneezing before they come into the building. So it becomes a compound of measures. So it takes care of... Um, you know, there, there is no one magic bullet. No one thing is going to prevent this. It's, it's, a, it's a series of measures that we build up. If you think about it in terms of a defence, if you look at a castle, it's got a moat around it, first of all. Then it's got really high walls. It's got battlements. We're doing exactly the same thing with COVID-19. Um, the important thing is, each of these bubbles or pods, we clean between each one. So as you move them on, there is a clean stage. Um, that effectively tries to reduce the TVC, total viable count of whatever it is they're bringing around. You know, ultimately, we're going to see, I hope, illness in the gym generally reduce. Now, the next thing we can look at is PPE. Okay, we've got socially distancing. We've got coaches who are socially distanced, unless they're supporting. Hang on, they're going to be supporting. Therefore, we're not socially distancing. How can we further reduce the risk? So, do I want to put my kids in gloves and, and, and grippy socks? I personally wouldn't. I think the risk of them turning their ankle or slipping or the glove snagging or pinging off or the gymnastics that they're doing. I mean, I'm talking about artistic gymnastics. I'm, you know, I, I have a limited knowledge of acro and um, uh, uh, other disciplines. You know, free running and, and women's autistic is my thing. Um, if you think it's appropriate for your sport, I'm not saying don't do it. What I'm saying is I wouldn't do it in my gym for the, the type of gymnastics I do because it's far more likely they're going to slip over and twist an ankle or ping off a bar or, or whatever else. Um, I wouldn't even do it for a wreck because, again, they're jumping around normally. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of putting, uh, uh, putting kids in, in, in PPE because it won't fit normally and it just increases risk. Again, it's down to your risk assessment. BG is not going to tell you that you should have them in socks or you shouldn't have them in socks. They're going to issue wonderful guidelines that say you, you must comply with um, COVID-19 safety. Up to you how you do it, which is exactly what the government will do. So it all comes back to your risk assessment, your opinion, your views. So if you want to put your kids, you know, if, I don't know, maybe running out of school hall, for argument's sake, Maybe that's what you're doing. Maybe you think socks are appropriate at that level. Again, I wouldn't. It's up to you. Um, but when we do get closer, we need to start thinking about PPE specifically for the coach. Okay? I'm not aware of suitable masks for children, particularly when they're tumbling. So what's the greater hazard? We put a kid in a mask, and we ask them to do a Randolph flick. Where's that mask going to end up by the time they've completed the Randolph flick? Probably over their eyes. Okay, so now we get them to do a Randolph flick full twist. So they can't spot their landing, they're trying to land blind at a height they can't see. They're certain to injure themselves. And actually, has that mask really prevented them from spreading COVID 19 that we've tried to stop at the door anyway? All we're going to have coming is a, 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 a asymptomatic sufferers. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's quite right about trampoline, D, D, DTM. Tra uh, trampoline guys are always in socks anyway. That's, again, safety measures for different equipment. <laughs> um, PPE, sorry, back, back on, 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 on face masks. Um, the, the, the cloth coverings you see, they're designed to stop people coughing and sneezing on people. They're already leaking all, all over the place. So in actual fact, the virus is, you know, if I have the virus, it's already going to spread around. So the gymnast in the face mask is only increasing the risk of actually other, other acute injuries, including, including twisted ankles and broken whatever. Um, the coach, however, what I'm proposing for my club is that we equip them with what's called an FFP3 dust mask. Now, these are specific to the asbestos injury industry or normally specific to the asbestos industry. They've also been used extensively by the NHS during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, what they are is a very fine particulate filter. Um, they are disposable um, and they will fit your face. They will form what's called a, a, fa a face fit seal. So when breathing through an FFP3, wherever you breathe in is being filtered. Is it comfortable? Mm, you get used to it. As an, asbestos, as an asbestos operative, I'll spend up to eight, 12 hours a day in a, in a mask. You forget it's there after a period of time. Initially, it is gonna feel really weird. I also intend to put uh, coaches in what's called F1 safety glasses. Can you coach safety in glasses? Yeah, of course you can. Okay, there's already people here wearing glasses. You know, you're obviously coaching safely. So that protects the eyes from flying sweat and other fluids. Okay, so the area that is susceptible to viruses is being protected on your coach. The kids that you have coming through is not really practical to. Um, it's not really practical to put, put um, children in, in that kind of equipment. So it's a risk you have to accept, hence the pod. Okay. Uh, yeah, face visors, that is up to you. It's not gonna prevent you breathing in virus. And I also think when you come to do this or do that, I think the visor is gonna get in the way. Uh, I did consider visors extensively. Um, my view is that when you're spotting, it becomes something else which is hard and sharp to catch kids on or yourself on. Um, and I don't know if anyone's worn a visor before. Um, they're not the lightest thing in the world either. They get in the way extensively. They'll, they'll restrict your movement quite a lot. That's, that's why we're taking the stance we're taking. That doesn't mean to say visors don't work for you but the virus does work on your respiratory tract. You have to inhale it um, for it to cause you harm. The visor is not gonna prevent you from inhaling a virus. Okay, that's, that's the point I'd make. The other way of, well, another mitigation measure is what's called dilution ventilation. So in other words, the more air we put through an area, the less fog of virus we're gonna have within it. So, for example, one gym club I know uh, has 12 air changes an hour. That's very, very high. Okay. Others have much, much lower air changes. <clears throat> um, that will help. So the more you change the air, bring in fresh air, the less virus is going to be. Will mass frighten little ones in the gym? Possibly. There is a new reality we need to get, we need to, uh, need to get on with. Um, I think having had three months of COVID-19, I think actually children are gonna be more frightened by not seeing any COVID controls in place. I think they're kind of used to it now. It's an opinion. They'll either get used to it or they won't. You know, it is a new norm we're, we're coming into. As I say, these are thoughts, suggestions. Looking at it from a, a purely technical point of view, these are steps we can take. Will it work for your gym? It's up to you. So face visors, cool. 
if you wanted to you combine both, you go with a full face respirator. You can still see your face on those with a power feed on it. But it's not really going to be a practical, uh, practical solution. Yeah, no masks are being used in PE at school. Are they undertaking any indoor work, any indoor PE work at the moment? Are teachers wearing masks? Some are, some aren't. Yeah. We've been to the barbers recently. Most of them are wearing masks. Restaurant workers are advisors. Again, I think there is a combination here of having to technically manage the um, virus against public perception. It is, a, it is a tough one. You know, the communication that I'll be sending out is fundamentally my risk assessment. This is what we're going to be doing and this is why. And invite questions from the parents. I think you'd be quite surprised what you get back. Some parents simply will, until it's over, we're not coming back anyway. That's the reality. There's some gym clubs have taken uh, various straw polls and you've got 50% want to come back in the gym, or sorry, 33% want to come back immediately. 33% want to wait until September. 33% are never coming back. That's the straw poll they've run. Are we going to have less people in the gym as a result of this? Absolutely. There will be less people in the gym, without question. Okay, if, uh, sorry, question to everyone. If temperature taking happens, then a surgical mask is sufficient rather than the FFP3. FFP3 is very useful. I, uh, for now, cold only with NHS. Again, it's whatever you feel comfortable with. Personally, I'd rather work in an FFP3. I find it more comfortable because it fits your face. A surgical mask is not. It's a comfort issue for me more than anything else. And then I get more protection. Honestly, uh, a piece of cloth pushed over your face, around your ears, will become uncomfortable after an hour or so. An FFP3 is going to sit on your face quite comfy, or as comfy as, uh, as they get. I did think about gloves for coaches when you're supporting. Um, I've decided I don't want to do that because I think when you're supporting, you have a feel and a touch with the gymnast. You understand through your fingers how, it's, how the gymnast is going to work and how much grip you've got on them. I think if you put a uh, coach into gloves, potentially you lose that touch. You may end up squeezing too much or slipping. Um, I'm simply going to wash my hands between gymnasts. That's, that's, that's going to be my approach. Um, because actually, the worst I'm going to do here is spread potentially a bit of sweat between gymnasts on their leotards. You know, I, I, you know, I don't know if anyone here has got boys. I know boys like to train with their shirts off. Personally, I'd, I'd keep them in leotards at the moment because it's another barrier. Um, but again, it's your risk assessment. There is no absolute answers. I cannot tell you that you know, wearing a hazmat suit is wrong because it's, it's right at, at some level. Okay. What I can say is that there is definitely a problem here. The option of doing nothing and giving lip service to it is not an option. With the lockdown situations that we're seeing, um, the government is looking towards us to be almost self-regulating. So effectively, Whatever we say is right for our industry is what should be done. And if we get it wrong, they expect us to self-isolate and lock down. Well, the feeling I'm getting around the gymnastics community at the moment is we're probably not taking it quite as seriously as perhaps we should. There's an awful lot of consideration about we've got to open. We've got to do this. We must be on this now. Has to open. We have to trade. My advice would be take things slowly. I don't personally think we're going to see gyms open in two weeks' time. I don't think the government is going to do that. I think what we're going to see, they announced the restaurant opening um, too early, is my gut feel. Um, we're already seeing spikes as a result of the uh, various street parties, protests, and other gatherings that we've seen. Um, and I think that's taken by, uh, as, as, as a surprise. You know, there's 20, 26 areas beside Leicester, which are potentially going to be locked down. Westminster, Kensington, uh, Kingston, uh, Chelsea, uh, 
Kensington, Kensington have been two of them. Um, Ealing, um, Hammersmith, Harrow, been uh, three others. They're all areas which are potentially going to be a lockdown back, back to where we were. So I don't think we should rush. I think what we should do is take our time a little bit, put in place genuinely robust plans. Let's share our risk assessments as, as, as a region. Let's go, actually, you know what, rather than taking the traditional view of it's secret, it's mine, let's share it. This is my approach. This is what I think we should do. And let's discuss it. There's no wrong ideas here. At the end of the day, there's ideas that potentially others haven't thought of. I mean, I haven't even started touching on how do you sanitize the front floor? How do you clean a, a trampoline bed? Okay, the only way of doing it is with a heavy filter vacuum cleaner. But the other question I've raised with a trampoline for argument's sake is bearing in mind you've got your gymnast in socks, in a leotard, how much virus are they actually gonna be contacting on the trampoline bed between goes? No one knows because the research hasn't been done. Is there any benefit in running a Dyson over it between gymnasts? Probably not. Is it practical? Definitely not. Is that not just a risk that we're going to have to live with potentially? It's a question more than it is a statement. I don't know. Um, I think there's, there's things we can do and I think, I think there's things that we can't do. And it may be that possibly we are slower on some things that we're unsure of rather than we take the attitude we've got to go now because we haven't we're already locked down the very worst we're going to do is we're not going to have our gymnast in the gym for another couple of weeks a couple of months maybe that's the worst case so uh let's go through the questions i've missed so far Dettol fabric spray to help some of our surfaces yeah Dettol's great um, we're going to use it on, our, on, on all our equipment. I've been bulk buying it by the, the pallet load. I've got more antibacterial spray than you can shake a stick at. Um, I've actually got some anti antivirus stuff as well, which is that was hard to find, but um, yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, the point I would make is your equipment has to be dry. So, whatever you do, you know, this stuff is always going to be slightly soapy, so therefore slightly slippery. And if you've got a wet surface and a gymnast that takes a tumble and knocks themselves unconscious or worse, you're certainly going to get sued. Or worse. Because what we haven't covered is the actual the health and safety law position on all this. I don't want to frighten anyone on this, but I'll, I'll bring you up the speed with it. At the moment, I think everyone here is, is coaching for a club that charges gymnasts to, for uh, admission. Therefore, it is a business. I think we all agree on that. We can't, we can't pretend it's not. It is a business. Okay, so it is a commercial um, situation. The Health and Safety, uh, Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 applies. Now, specifically, what we're looking at here is section, uh, section two, which requires us to put in place adequate risk controls and a safe system of work. Well, we've been talking about that for the last half hour, 40 minutes. Okay, that's section two. Okay, there's section nine, which is employees' responsibilities. So if the club puts in place a series of control measures, the employees or the coaches have to do as they're told. They have to use the, uh, the safe systems of work. It's not optional. It's not, oh, I'll take the risk, I choose to. No, you won't. At the end of the day, we as a business or we as the organization, whichever you choose to call yourself, are telling our employees, this is how we're protecting their safety and those not in our employ, section three. So if we fail to undertake any of those activities, we fail to put in place safe system of work, we fail to enforce the management of the safe system of work, the club can be prosecuted. Freelance coaches are, in, are included as well, they're employees, subcontractors. So if they come to, choose to come into your club and coach for you for a sum of money, they will follow your rules. That's it. There's no discussion on the matter. 
if they want to talk about improving a safe system of work and they come with other ideas, that's fine. But that's not a change they make unilaterally without consultation, without it going through the documented process. Your risk assessments have to be written down. Your safe systems of work have to be written down. We can't just have stuff which is, oh, we always do that. No. Really straightforward, natural fact, you should have risk assessments for all the activities you undertake anyway. You should have a coaching risk assessment. You should have a health and safety policy statement. Health surveillance, possibly, for some elements. All of that sort of stuff should be in existence already. Definitely fire risk assessments, emergency procedures, first aid procedures. And again, your COVID-19 considerations have to extend to abnormal operations. What happens in a fire emergency? What happens if we have someone who has a nosebleed? What happens if we have someone who has a heart attack? CPR rules have changed. You don't give mouth to mouth anymore. Basically, you cover that person's face with a cloth towel or something and you perform CPR until the ambulance gets there. Which to a bystander is gonna look really weird. Hang on a minute, you're putting something over this person's face and you're trying to save their life. Hmm, aren't you smothering them? That, that is the current guidelines in the British Heart Foundation. So there is a lot of learning to do here. It's not a question, as I say, of woohoo, BG says we can open. Because actually, on one hand, we've got a legal perspective whereby the HSE or the police could prosecute or shut, shut you down, or both. You have public, public perception, your members' perception. Okay? What we're seeing a lot in the construction industry is people going back to work following the safe systems work correctly. But then you get uh, helpful bystanders sending in videos to whoever it happens to be, including no with solicitors, saying, I've seen this, I don't think it's right. You need to be prepared for that sort of claim, that kind of vexatious uh, attempt. And of course, there's finally the reputation. You know, I like to think we've got a reasonably good reputation. Anyone's reputation can be better. But do you really want to know that being known as a club who doesn't care about COVID. Go to such and such club and get a free dose of COVID-19. That's not a great advertising pitch in any way, shape or form. Okay, um, so in summary, control measures need to work for everything, not just for COVID-19. You need to consider not just social distancing, not just PPE, not just health surveillance, the whole lot has to work together as a cohesive unit and it has to survive a clash with reality. A plan is merely a plan to it survives its first clash with reality. And when it hits reality and things break, it needs to change. And that, that, that those changes need to address the problems you've identified. What we're going to do is we're going to bring back gymnasts slowly. You know, we're going to bring our squads back first, not necessarily all of them together. We're going to bring back squads in order. So we start off with maybe 12 kids in the gym. Then we go to 24, actually using the space. But we're gonna stagger it so as we have control. So that clash with reality is a bit softer. In terms of social distancing, okay. That's actually a really good question. One meter social distancing or two meters. The guidelines are really, really straightforward. Two meters should be maintained unless absolutely vital to actually uh, uh, reduce it. Okay, the one meter rule is not a rule. You can go down to one meter as long as there's mitigation measures in place, which is why I'm going heavier with the PPE for the coach than anything else, because we're taking that one meter rule and we're going, actually, I'm touching you. We're, not, we're far closer than one meter. To do my job safely, that's what I've got to do. Okay, so again, there is social distancing when you're not touching, two meters, brilliant. That's what your BG guidance is set up for. That's why they've got their two meter by three meter square. Okay. Every club I know that's actually got their planning done is actually allowing more space than that. They're going, great, it's a minimum guideline. We use more space. There's more space, more dilution, less virus. The other question I'm getting asked all the time is, shall we leave the fire exit doors open? Well, can you leave them open and maintain your child welfare uh, position? That's the first question. Can you use fire exits actually as a means of 
access and egress. Well, yes, as long as you're not compromising your fire emergency procedure, why not? I will be, as is every other gym that I'm working with on this particular subject. In terms of how much handling of gymnasts I'll be doing, I do very little already. I prefer my gymnasts to um, support or self-support as much as possible, actually work progressions on, on, onto safety max. I only support when absolutely necessary. Um, as a guideline, I think the less you touch them, the better. Not just from COVID-19, but you know, let's face it, they're, they're grubby, horrible gymnasts. No one really knows where they've been. Um, so yeah, I would tend to reduce the contact with them as far as possible. Uh, any questions, really? I think you know we're at the we're at the uh, forty-five minute mark now. I think I've ranted for long enough. Um, do you want to, you know, turn your turn your mics back on again and, and, and fire the questions over? If not, I can go for another forty-five minutes. No problem at all. And um, hi, Will. Oh. Sorry, it's, it's, sorry, it's Maria. Um, the risk assessment that I've done, um, obviously that you've answered the question regarding um, children coming out of the back stairs um, in the fire exit. Um, I've positioned a member of staff there um, at all times. Is that going overboard? Because our emergency procedures will not change either. They will remain exactly the same. I, I think oh. if you're putting in place an additional means of egress or access, yeah. one of the considerations we have with some of the kids in our gym is that they have um, difficult home lives and um, dad is potentially or mum is potentially excluded from uh, seeing the child. And what we have had in the past, we have had people turn up at the gym with the intention of uh, seeing or communicating with their, with their child. Um, if you don't have that situation, then maybe you can reduce the, uh, the, the staffing on, on the staircase. If you do have it, maybe you need to maintain it. Um, it's very difficult to give a, a, a verbatim answer because you know, if you don't think you need it, possibly you don't. Right. In which case you can reduce it, but you need to be able to justify that decision. The, the position I always take with any risk assessment I do is if I had to stand up in a court of law and I was facing a £25,000 fine, or 10 years in prison, which is exactly what you are potentially facing for infringement of health and safety law, would I be able to justify the decision I've taken? If the answer to that is yes, then you've probably made the right decision. Okay. If you're okay. looking at it and going, mm, I'm not so sure, then yeah, the answer is probably no. I think from, you know, we're, we're at Europa, um, mm. the children are more or less, <laughs> It sounds bizarre, but in a cage because they can't get get out or anyone come in until we let them. So the fact that I have positioned somebody by that door probably actually wouldn't need to be there because nobody can e en enter downstairs. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. It, it sounds like you've probably got the they got the uh, the position boxed off. You know, yeah. by all means, send your risk assessments over to me. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. You want you know, feedback, send them over. Thank you. Well, I, I have a question because we are we work primarily in schools. I know a number of people are in the same situation, so we don't have a designated gym. Yeah. Um, so we are planning to run a camp in the summer. Um, the schools obviously desperately need the income to 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 sustain life um we're going to be doing those socially distanced in bubbles of eight yep. or ten um but my big issue actually is the toilets and then coming in with their bags and then going back to the bags to collect them again and that's where i see a, a possible cross-contamination issue because we're likely to have somebody standing outside the toilets there are three toilets and there are three sinks each with a meter between them and it's going to be a three in, three out system. You're going to hate this answer. Okay, you know, go ahead. That's why I'm asking it. Yeah. Okay. Toilet cleaning is going to have to happen a lot more frequently. Now, if you're working in schools, I don't know if, if your school, you're very lucky they're letting you back in. I've asked the question with our school and we're not even talking to you until September is the response I've got. 
we're not taking any bookings till September. So you're very, very lucky. Um, the next point I'll say- It's only one, it's only one out of about 10. <laughs> yeah, you're just, again, one would be enough for us, but you know, we're not allowed in until September at the earliest. Um, hence, you can see I'm fairly laid back about things at the moment. Um, toilets need to be cleaned far more frequently. As a guideline on construction sites, bearing in mind these are hairy builders who have questionable, you know, uh, personal hygiene at the best of times, they clean the toilets between two and three, uh, four times a day extra. Uh, that is a full clean down, disinfection, everything. Um, in terms of uh, stacking stuff, one of the better ideas I've seen come up with is a bucket, what's called the bucket idea. Um, so in other words, a kid turns up, they get given a B&Q bucket. Their belongings go in the bucket and the bucket goes with them. Wherever they go in the gym, the bucket follows them. So effectively, there's no, there's, there's, there's no cross-contamination. That works really well with the one-way system. So if you come at the front of the building, you pump your track suit and your water bottle and your shoes in the bucket, and you wander through the gym with it. So from station to station, you have an area marked out where the buckets belong. They do the, their activity, they move on to the next station, the buckets go with them. So in actual fact, there's, there's, there's no cross-contamination at that point. That's only, one... only if the buckets are left one meter apart from each other. The issue is actually that the buckets are put down next to each other and the kids then go to their bucket and it's right next to the other kids' bucket. bucket. It would only be a risk if they were touching each other's buckets though. There is a risk of um, touching each other's buckets. I mean, you, you cannot reduce the risk to zero, okay? So if we were to radiate the gym, you know, for example, you could uh, sterilize everything with, with UVA. If you look on um, www.goodlight.co.uk, um, they have a UVA light tube solution, and they've even come up with a, a light wand, which actually you can waft over equipment, you can waft over, <laughs> waft over anything, okay? And it will kill the virus, including trampoline beds for that matter, and it's dry. Only problem with that is, is radiation, okay? If someone stares at it long enough, it will blind them. And when I say long enough, I'm talking to 30 to 40 seconds. Um, and it will, uh, it will uh, assist with skin cancer. So is it, is it good enough? Or is it, is it enough of a, a mitigation to bring that risk into the gym? Coming back to the buckets, you know, if they're stuck, stacked less than one metre apart, is that actually a problem as long as the people aren't one metre apart? Because actually it's the person that is, is expiring and is putting virus out, assuming they have it. But don't forget, we're doing everything we can to exclude people from the gym in the first place who potentially have COVID-19. So that, you know, everything we do in the gym is, is a secondary defense. Our first defense is excluding it from the gym in the first place. That's really our golden opportunity to stay virus free. Everything in the gym is mitigating a problem that's already happened. So yeah, if the buckets are 500 millimeters apart, and they go one at a time to get them. Is that a problem? Probably not. Does it take management? Yes. Is it going to be pain in the neck? Yes. Um, I'm conscious of time. We'll allow a bit of time after the recording stops for any further questions. Uh, Will, any final comments for the for the session, for the recording session? Uh, for, for, uh, for recording session? No, I mean, if anyone does need assistance, drop me a line, okay? My email address is william at priorityrisk.co.uk. My mobile number is 07708 237 980. Okay, advice over the phone, I'm not going to charge for. Okay, I want to see our region come out of the COVID 19 uh, pandemic stronger than when it went in. Okay. And if that takes a bit of time, then fine. I'll, I'll invest a bit of time in that. If I actually have to start uh, writing stuff, uh, writing uh, stuff, and taking professional liability, then unfortunately there will be a charge. But advice over the phone. Just ring me up, and we'll, we'll chew the cud, and we'll, we'll get things straightened out. My mobile number, one more time, is zero seven seven zero eight two three seven nine eight zero. And the email address. Okay. And uh, if we. Can uh, so email address is william at priorityrisk.co.uk. Thank you very much for your time, Will.